Chapter 4 Whalers Seagull Island In a lifeboat across Saldana Bay Monsoonin on land Kafirs and Hottentots The Southeast Trade Winds Daily Life on Board St. Helena When we were on board we heard that for the first time mother had climbed up in the rigging as far as the cross trees, a little more than halfway. The next day I started to make my red Indian hat with the feathers from Seagull Island. Mother again went up aloft, and from now on she climbed a little bit higher each day. Carl Jensen and Christensen rode over to the island to have a look around, and when they had been walking a bit, one of them found a seagull's egg. That made them think there must be many more, and they started to hunt round. They came home with 42 eggs. In the evening, some Norwegians came on board. One of them was the skipper of a whaling ship, Harald Growing, and the others some of his fine crew. The skipper himself was not one of those smart captains with uniforms, but he had a whaling ship to command over, and was a fine young fellow, about 28 years old. He sang some Norwegian songs for us, and there could be no doubt but that he sang beautifully. Next day, we saw a whaling ship come in with two whales. Father said that we could go ashore and watch the whales being flensed and cut up. We were terribly pleased about that, and soon after we went ashore in the boat, and Mother came too. When we arrived, we saw something really marvelous, and the best thing about it was that we saw the whole thing right from the very start. At first, the whales lay floating in the water, because there was air in them, when they were caught. When the whaling ship came in, the crew untied the two whales from the hawses, so that they came to lie right opposite the place to which they were going to be hauled up. A couple of kafirs rode, <clears throat> rode out to one of the whales in a little boat, and pulled a heavy chain through a hole which had been cut in the whale's tail. The chain went up on shore to a large clear space on the beach where the whale could lie. At the back there was a big engine which was working the whole time. The chain was fixed to the engine and then the engine started to pull the chain so that the whale was dragged up on land over a sloping board, which reached from the shore out into the water. The whale was soon on the beach. The chain was taken off, and now the kafirs started to cut big gashes into the blubber, which was just over 10 centimeters thick. They cut with blades 5 centimeters, broad, which were fixed into long handles. The blades were curved so much that they looked very like a taut bow, and they were very good for cutting into the thick blub blubber. Kafirs cut in certain definite places, in some so that the blood could escape, in others so as to get the blubber off. The blubber was cut up in long strips, which could be pulled off the whale lengthways. At one end of the strip, they cut a hole through which they passed a rope, 
This was fastened to the machine, and it then pulled off the blubber. While the blubber was being pulled off in this way, a man stood by the side of the whale and helped by pulling a bit when it wouldn't come off properly. When the blubber on the top side had been pulled off, the whale was turned over, and that was done like this. They first cut a hole in the blubber on the side opposite to that onto which the whale was going to be turned. Through the hole they passed a chain, which went over a block and tackle on the side opposite to that on which the hole was. The chain was fixed to the machine, which was then started up and which turned the whale over onto its other side. After a time, this side was also finished. The kafirs then put chains round the blubber, which the engine pulled over to a corner of the open space, where it was cut up into small pieces and put down a hole. From this hole, the pieces were carried to big boilers, where they were boiled into steam. The boilers were about two meters across and four meters high. Now it was the turn of the meat of the whale. This was cut up into big pieces which were dragged over another sloping board to a sort of lift outside a big house. The meat was then carried up to the top of the lift and from there it was thrown down into one of the big boilers where the oil was boiled out of it. The backbone was sawn up into big pieces, which were ground to a fine powder. This is used for manure and chicken food. The dry meat from which the oil had been boiled was also ground and used for the same purpose. While the whales were being cut up, a lot of seagulls circled over them, and from time to time they dived down and pinched a little piece of meat. We also saw how the kafirs sharpened their knives on a big grind stone, which was kept turning the whole time. Everybody was very pleased with this whale, because it was a blue whale. The blue whale is the best kind of whale they can catch. <clears throat> The owner of the whole business, Johnson, was a multi-millionaire. That is quite easy to understand, because one blue whale alone is worth 15,000 kroner. The skipper of the ship, which had caught the whale, was given 90 kroner for the blue whale, and each one of the sailors got 11 kroner. The mate, the engineers, and the others, who were higher in rank, then the sailors each got a bit more than 11 kroner, but I don't know exactly how much they got. A sperm whale is not worth quite so much, a finback whale very much less, and a humpback whale almost nothing compared with the others. After we had seen all this, <clears throat> we went back on board. Jan and I had to have our lessons again. We had been thinking these last few days that it would be great fun if Father and the crew could manage to go out on a whaling ship, and it was decided that Christensen should be the first to ask. He did, and was allowed to go in a boat called the Delgoa Harold Rowan's ship. That day... We had no time to collect eggs, but Carl and Jensen tried to fish near the island and came back with a pailful of fish. They were as big as ordinary cod, but they didn't look like cod and seemed very fierce. They were grayish in color with bright red fins except for the big fin on each side, which was dark with blue and red markings. Before we ate them, we first boiled one of the heads with a silver spoon 
to see if they were poisonous, but they weren't. They were lovely to eat. After we had eaten, Carl and Jensen wanted to go off again and fish. The cook went with them, and when they came back, they had another whole pailful. Now we had as much fish as money could buy. Father said that this was the best place we had ever dropped anchor in. On April 30th, something strange happened. Mother wanted to bathe because the weather was so fine, but she hardly said so when we saw a huge fish playing in the water with one of the boxes which the harpooners used for practicing on. Jensen thought at first that it was a baby whale, but as we weren't sure, Father sculled over to the station and asked. When Father came back a little while later, he told us that it was a shark, and that the people at the station had thought that it must be about 16 feet long. They had also told him that it was very rare for such a big shark to come so far in. It was lucky that we had seen the big shark, otherwise Mother might have been eaten, and this wouldn't have been fun for anyone except the shark. There were plenty of small sharks about, two feet long, round here, but they were not dangerous. The Kafirs caught them and ate them, but you wouldn't catch me eating one of them. We often saw harpooners practicing shooting. They had a box in the water tied to a buoy, and that was what they practiced on. It was about 20 to 30 meters away from the whaling ship. A kind of gun is fixed up in the bows of the whaling ship. The harpoon is placed inside the gun, and when everything is ready, the harpooner pulls the trigger and the gun goes off. When the harpoon hit the box, the skipper, who was the harpooner, was pleased. But when he didn't hit it, it meant that he was not such a good shot, and therefore he practiced many more times. A good shot earns most, for he catches most whales. The harpoon is just over one meter long, with movable barbs, and it has a thick iron handle. A point with a grenade on is screwed into that end of the harpoon, which enters the whale first. When the harpoon hits the whale, the grenade explodes inside the whale and brings on its death more quickly. At the other end of the harpoon is tied a whale line, which lies coiled up in the whaling ship. When the whale pulls at the line, it gets tired in the, end, <clears throat> in the end, and that also helps to kill it. This day, Alfred made us fillets of fish from the fish they had caught. In the afternoon, Father Jensen, Carl, Turr, and I rode over to the island to look for eggs. I found the first one, but Jensen, the bird catcher, and egg collector from the Faroe Islands found 45 eggs, Carl found 18, Father 5, Jan 2, Tur 2, and I 9. Since we had found so many eggs, there would easily be enough to make a chocolate cake. Mother and I helped each other, and we made two, because we had <coughs> two molds and we hadn't had chocolate cakes since we left Denmark, so that we were looking forward terribly much to having some again. That evening we had four eggs each for supper, and as they were almost as big as hen's eggs, they made us quite full up. At midnight, Jensen went off in a whaling ship. In the morning of May 1st, Christensen returned from his whale hunt with the Delagoa, but they had not caught a single whale. They came back 
because the stove and the galley had burst so that they couldn't cook any food. The ship had come back once before without a whale. That time it was because the cook was seasick. It was very annoying for Christensen, but still he would probably be able to go out some other day. At midday, Jan and I rowed over to the island and found three eggs which we beat in the way Grandmother had taught us, and these we shared between us. At about four o'clock, Carl Jensen and Max went out sailing in the lifeboat while Mother and Christensen went over to the island, where they found nine eggs. Towards evening, a stiff breeze sprang up, but everyone got back home safely. Next day, Carl started to build a new WC, which was going to stand on deck, because it is not pleasant to have WC next to a cabin below deck. That day, Mother climbed up the main rigging, as far as the highest of the rat lines. By now, I could walk out on the bow sprit like Jensen, and if one walks his way, one can't fall down. From there, I could climb down into the boat, when Jan had it beneath the bow sprit. Jan and I often went on shore <clears throat> in the boat, and there we discovered a lot of sea urchins and sea anemones. They were of all colors and were stuck on the rocks beneath the water. On May 3rd, Mother Jan Tur and I went to the island and found nine eggs. We had discovered a place on the island where there was a lovely sandy beach, and the bottom was also sandy. That was where we bathed, as we had also noticed that there were sand fleas on the shore. We put on old stockings when we went into the water. The sea bottom went down so steeply that I very soon had to swim. But even if I had gone out only a few steps, Mother would say that I mustn't go any farther because there might be sharks swimming about. On the 4th, we received a boatload of provisions, and in the morning, Mother, Father, Jan, Tur, and I went ashore to watch a finback whale being flensed. A finback whale is white on the sides and belly, and in the white part there are some deep, wide cracks, about three centimeters deep in the blubber, the white part looked like porcelain, which someone has cracked on purpose. In the afternoon, Mr. Johnson came on board, while Mother Jan, Tur, and I were over on the island bathing from our lovely sandy beach. We had brought sandwiches and orangeade, but we were there such a short time that we had no time to look for eggs. We got back on board after coffee time, and while Mother was talking with Mr. Johnson and her and I were <clears throat> on the ship, Jan, who had been playing in the boat, suddenly cried out that there was a fish on the line, which we had left hanging overboard, but before Jan could get it hauled on board, the fish had wriggled off the hook and swum away. A moment later, we had another bite, and I hurriedly hauled up the line. It turned out to be a shark, two feet long, the same kind that the kaffirs eat, but as we didn't care to eat shark, we threw it out, after first having killed it. Monday, May 5th, Jan, Tur, and I sailed over to the island to look for eggs. We didn't find more than three. However, because the seagull's nesting season was almost over, and the kaffirs had also started to collect eggs several times a day, we couldn't come over so often, of course, because we had to go to lessons. This day, two whaling ships came in, and Cookie was taken on by one of them, which was called 
truels the following day at four thirty in the morning father went off with the whaling ship delagoa that day there was a strong wind blowing and a few drops of rain fell next morning alfred came back on the truels which had a finback whale and in the evening he had so much to tell us about it that you might have thought they had caught all the whales in the South Atlantic, although the season hadn't even started properly. Alfred said that they had seen a lot of grampuses, dolphins, and whales, but anyway they had only caught one whale after all. This day again there was a strong wind blowing, and in the evening father came back on the Delagoa. At breakfast, Next morning, father told us a funny story, which had happened to him on the whaler. He was up in the crow's nest, keeping lookout together with another man, when they saw spouts from a blue whale. And when they got a little bit closer, the other man suddenly shouted, It's bleeding! You can imagine how they all laughed at him, for of course the blood was only the red stuff which the whale excretes. You know, of course, what that is. No, I told you about it the Sunday we were lying outside Cape Town with no wind. May 9th, a whaler arrived, on which Max could have gone, as it was his turn, but all the same, he didn't want to go. At midday, Jan and I were over on the island, as usual, to look for eggs, but as we didn't find a single one, we decided that we wouldn't look for eggs any longer. The Kaffirs didn't come over to the island any more either, as the nesting season of the birds was over. This day, the new W.C. was finished. Of course, there had to be a grand opening ceremony, and everybody had to come along and try it out. Saturday morning, May 11th, the whaling ship, Coburg, came in with five whales, and the Delagoa with four. That day, I finished my red Indian hat, and we had fish risoles for dinner. Yum yum! How lovely they tasted. We hadn't had them since we left Denmark. On the Sunday, father was going over to a town called Saldana, which lies in a little bay five miles across the water from where we were lying. Father asked if anybody wanted to come with him, but nobody did except Carl, Jan, Tur, and I. Tur, however, was too small to go, so then father took Carl, Jan, and myself with him to go and fetch the snaps which the photographer in Cape Town had printed for him and sent to this town. It was a hotel proprietor called Silverman, by the way, the only hotel proprietor in the whole Big Bay who had them. We were to sail over in the lifeboat, but Mother wouldn't let us leave until we had each taken a box of toffees, six apples, a bottle of orangeade, and a coat. There was a dead calm, and as we were rowing along, we suddenly caught sight of something which at first we took to be a piece of kelp. Then we thought it was a shark and finally we decided it was a turtle. But then we discovered that if it was a turtle, it must have been a mock turtle. It was a seal. We were only a few inches away from it and could touch it with an oar. Then the seal suddenly woke up, wriggled about a few seconds to get back on an even keel, and then dived below and swam far away. A little while later, we saw the seal come up some way from us to get air. It pushed its head and almost a third of its body 
out of the water and shook itself so that water splashed all around. Its head didn't look like the head of a proper seal at all, but like that of a bear, and the skin on its head and neck also looked like that of a bear. Father said that as it looked so much like a bear, it must be a sea bear. After that it shook itself once more and lay down to sleep again. And now one could see again the big and the little flippers, which stuck up above the water. On our way to Saldana, we saw two or three more sea bears. For about half an hour, we had no wind at all. Then a tiny breeze sprang up, and we set all sails and started to sail, although we didn't go very fast. Father and Carl took it in turns to row and steer. That was fine, and the wind was blowing straight from behind us. Jan and I also steered a bit. When we had got halfway, there was once again a dead calm, but soon after a strong headwind sprang up, only through Father or Carl sitting to leeward and rowing with one oar did we succeed in getting round the point which lay the bay. Otherwise we would have run aground. It was very tiring to row in this wind, and Father's best coat got wringing wet with sea water, even though Carl, Jan, and I were wearing thick coats. We too got wet through to our skins, and we had to lean over to windward, or the boat would have capsized. Finally we reached the point, and then it was only by one meter that we escaped being thrown onto the rocks. It was no good sailing any farther in this direction, because the seas ran very high, so we had to alter our course. When we had turned, we sailed so far across the bay that we could get into Saldana without having to tack. Then we turned again, but suddenly there came a terrific gust of wind, and if Father hadn't been keeping such a good lookout, we should have capsized. Unfortunately, when Father cast off the sheets, he lost the oar we were steering with, because the rudder was broken. As we couldn't do without the oar, we had to turn back again. I really do hope that we shall be able to afford better gear next time the monsoonin sets out for a long voyage. At last we got in safe and sound, and very cheerful, but as wet as drowned rats. When my hair dried, it was white with salt. We tied the boat to a big bridge, ate some toffees, and then started to walk up to the town, while the water dripped from our trousers. We soon found the hotel, and went in and asked for Mr. Silverman. A fat old woman answered gruffly that if he was not at home, he would be at his crayfish factory. We went to his house first, where we were told by a young lady where the crayfish factory was. On our way to the factory, we met Mr. Silverman. He looked like a real hotel proprietor, and Father Carl Jan and I thought quietly to ourselves, what a lovely hot dinner we shall have, but no, nothing of the kind. However, we got the photos, and they were all of them very good. Then we went into the nearest house and asked for Mr. Wheatley. We were told that he was down at his crayfish factory, for Mr. Wheatley and Mr. Silverman were rivals. They sent two kids with us to show us where the factory was. His brother-in-law lived in the house where we had inquired. It was a good long way to walk before we got to the factory, and when the wind blew, the sand from the road flew up into our eyes. At last we got there, 
and in the factory we saw some carriages full of hot boiled crayfish. There were a lot of children outside the factory. They ran in and out, and whenever a cartload of hot crayfish came along, they ran in and broke off the legs, cracked them, and ate the meat inside. They were allowed to do that, and they loved it. One boy gave Father Carl and myself some legs. Jan didn't want any. Then Mr. Wheatley came, and Father thanked him for having promised Father to get the monsoonin <clears throat> beached here so that she could have her bottom scraped and painted. He had also wanted to supply Father with paint and lend him workmen, but now we were going to beach the boat at Donkagot instead, and that was better for both. Mr. Wheatley was a nice, tall man with dark hair. He was much nicer than Mr. Silverman, and he was dressed in workman's overalls. We went with him up to his office, and he chatted a long time with Father. A little while later, his brother-in-law came in. Mr. Wheatley asked him to pack up some crayfish for us. We got six, and we also got some in tens. These crayfish are not the same kind we get in Denmark. They didn't have the big claws that the Danish ones have. They are boiled and tinned and packed in big boxes. And then they are sent away to various places. Most of them are shipped to France. Mr. Wheatley also asked his brother-in-law if he would take us to his home and give us tea, and he said that of course he would. So we said goodbye to the nice Mr. Wheatley and went with his brother-in-law and the kids back to their home. When we got inside the house, dinner was just ready, and the brother-in-law asked if we wouldn't like some food as well. We said, yes, thank you, and soon after, his wife, smiling and looking very sweet, put the food on the table. We did not help ourselves to the first course. It was already dished out when the plates were carried in. On each plate lay a little heap of rice, a whole boiled egg, a whole boiled onion, some minced meat, one or two small fried potatoes, a quarter of a cauliflower, and a sort of white sauce which tasted a bit of meat and a bit of cauliflower. In a little glass dish which stood on the table lay slices of tomato and vinegar and pepper. We could help ourselves to some if we wanted to, and they tasted lovely. <clears throat> when we had finished this course, two dishes were brought in on a tray. In one was hot, and in the other cold food. The cold food was a kind of sauce which was yellow and tasted exactly like the yellow vanilla sauce we got in Denmark, only it was thicker. The other, I think, was some sort of apricots stewed together with prunes, but they tasted much better. They were stewed in water so that they had a little juice. The yellow vanilla sauce we were supposed to pour on top. This also tasted lovely. When we had finished dinner, we got tea with cream. and sugar. Father and Carl smoked a cigarette, and Jan and I had a big toffee each. Then it was time to leave again, but first we showed them our photos and presented them with one, because they had been so kind to us. After having thanked them for their kindness and for the food they had given us, we left. The children came with us to the boat, the wind was blowing just as hard as before. 
we could see the big fishing boats, which went out to fish for crayfish, come into the harbor with reefed sails, and all the fishermen were wearing oil skins. We gave the children and one man who had helped us a bit, one apple each, and some toffees. Then we drank a little orangeade, put our wet coats on again, and soon after we stood out to sea with all sails set. On the run home, we had the wind dead astern, so we shot along like greased lightning. Jan and I steered almost the whole way. When we had got halfway, we saw a lot of birds flying towards land in the direction of Saldana. I think there must have been over a million birds. They looked like a long, thick black line, which started above the two penguin islands that lie where the bay opens out to sea. We could see that the line was still quite black with birds over the two islands. It went on and on all the time. We could see it. And that was for more than an hour. But I think it went on even longer. Only after that, it wasn't in sight any longer. They were cormorants. We also saw five porpoises. They leap out of the water like dolphins. Then the wind dropped a good bit. And by the time we got home, it was almost dead calm. When we were almost home, we remembered that Father had brought two Easter eggs with him. We ate them there and then, for we didn't want to confess at home that we had anything left of what we had taken with us, not when it tasted so good. We also drank up the orangeade. We were very thirsty, for the water in Saldana Bay is twice as salty as the water in the Atlantic. Soon we were home, and they all received us with open arms. Tur met us with shining eyes, and showed us his new red Indian hat, which he said Mother and he had made while we were away. In the evening, a Norwegian steward from the station came on board, and when Tur was saying good night. Father asked him if he wouldn't like to have that nice old man for grandfather. He wanted to very much, and after that he always called the steward grandpa. On the Monday, Christensen went out with the whaler Trules. We all hoped very much that poor Christensen would come home with at least one little whale. Next morning, we got up early to get everything ready for beaching the monsoonin. First, we hauled up so much of the anchor chain that the rest could easily be hauled up when necessary. Then we washed her thoroughly, for now it would probably be a couple of days before the monsoonin got another wash. After dinner, the carpenter and some other men came out to us in a motor boat. And a couple of rowing boats. They brought with them a cable, one end of which they left with us, and the other they tied to a big buoy. There was another cable which ran from the mole out to the monsoonin. While we were warping the monsoonin in towards the slip way, a lot of kafirs came on board in the little boats. They started to help us without our asking them, and soon we were hauling with half a score of kafirs behind us, who all the time shouted in chorus, A hi, a hi, a hi, and we others also shouted, A hive, a hi, at the top of our voices. Jan had sculled our boat over to the mole, but he came on board again in one of the little boats to help us pull. Soon we had hauled the ship over a big carriage which stood in the water, and a line was thrown ashore from the ship. 
the carriage ran on rails on a sloping board of wood. When the ship was resting on the carriage, we hauled in the line at the same time as the carriage was being hauled ashore by an engine. Soon the engine was switched on full, and we drove slowly up the slipway. The carriage on which the ship was standing was made of iron, and on each side there were sloping beams on which the monsoonin could rest. This kind of carriage is called a cradle. At last we were on shore, and the carriage was made fast with a heavy iron chain, so that it should not roll down again. A cable stretched from the ma main mast to the shore on our port side. It was meant to help keep the monsoonin upright. There were also a couple of cables which stretched right across the deck and were made fast on the slipway. Now the monsoonin could not possibly tip over. Next morning, Luff went down on land so that he could stretch his legs a bit. Christensen carried him down a long step ladder which had been put up against the side of the monsoonin. Luff was very pleased to get on land. He ran and barked and played with the other dogs. But when we were all sitting down in the saloon having dinner, we suddenly heard a miserable howl and hurried to the step ladder where the noise came from. There we saw Luff standing on the top step. He was longing for us. He had managed to get up as far as that with a terrific effort, but he couldn't get on board. So we lifted him over the gunwale and he started to jump around very happily. Soon after we heard another howl. It came from another dog, Luff's playmate, who had also crawled up the step ladder. Christensen lifted him on board, but after dinner he was carried down again. Christensen, Jensen, and Carl were to go down after dinner and scrape and scrub the monsoonin's bottom. Three or four Negroes helped them to scrape and scrub, while five or six other Negroes poured water over. That day, Mother paid a visit to the steward and his wife, who also came from Norway. Next day, when the monsoonin was dry, they started to paint her bottom with some sort of brown paint, which is good for the bottom of wooden ships. Jan Tur and I played about for a long time by the cradle. Jan and I climbed ropes up and down the side of the ship. We also climbed up the anchor chain, and from there on board. We had great fun helping to scrape off the barnacles, although there were hardly any. Father was quite flabbergasted when he first climbed down to have a look at the bottom of the monsoonin, because it was almost quite clean, and it was only by the water line that there were some seaweed, but she badly needed paint. Next day, Jan went over to the Swedish carpenter to have his broken bow from Tenerife mended. I went with him to see how the carpenter would mend the bow, First he took a piece of oak because he had no ash, which is the best kind of wood for bows. Then he sawed with a machine saw so that it was the right size. Then he planed it with a machine plane till it got a slightly rounded shape like the bow. Then he placed it in water and told us to come back in the afternoon. When we came back, the piece of wood had become very easy to bend and springy, and now the carpenter told two kaffirs to tie it onto the bow. Soon it was done, and the bow mended, and after having thanked the nice carpenter, we went home very pleased and tried out the bow, 
and it turned out to be twice as good as before, and able to shoot twice as far. The same day, the bottom of the monsoonin was painted with a bright red paint, and in the evening provisions were brought on board, and now we were ready to go back into the water. Next day was Saturday, May 17th, the National Day of Freedom of the Norwegians, and we therefore flew all our signal flags, for at the station they were nearly all Norwegians. On this day, I don't know how many years ago, the Norwegians broke away from Denmark. We were all very cheerful, therefore, and in the evening the men drank a lot. Early next morning the chain was taken off, and a lot of Negroes, with iron bars, tried to make the wheels go round, and soon they started, and the carriage rolled down the slipway, and we were back home again in the water. Then we moved the ship to the inside of the mole. Then we took on board the rest of the provisions, because we meant to sail the next day. But as the little wind there was, was a head wind, and the current would drive us on shore, we decided not to sail, and didn't leave till Monday. On Sunday morning, Mother Christensen, Jan, and I went over to a little red lighthouse, which was five minutes' walk from the station. There were a lot of big stones against which the breakers threw themselves, so Jan, Tur, and I undressed and went and stood on the stones, which lay farthest out, and got proper shower baths. We dried ourselves in the sun, which shone in a heavenly fashion, and we sunbathed for ages. On Monday, May 19th, Father said that now we were going to sail, whatever kind of weather it might be, because we had lain here long enough. We others were also pleased to get to sea again. Alfred went about the whole time saying that we should certainly not get to St. Helena before July, and Mother agreed with him. Wind and current were against us, and it was so foggy that one couldn't see a thing, but otherwise the weather was fine, if one can call it fine weather when there is no wind, and one wants to sail in a sailing ship. We had to tack and tack to get out of the bay, and we had to do our steering while keeping a sharp ear for the breakers, because it was so foggy. Whenever we heard that there were breakers near, we turned. This day Carl sawed a big hole in the roof of the galley, for Alfred said that he could hardly breathe in there. Carl also made a trap door to put over the hole when it rained, or when the weather grew cold again. But now we were first going to sail through the tropics, Soon the roof of the galley was just a mass of holes, so that it looked as if Alfred was getting enough air. There were little trap doors over every one of them to shut them up. Next morning, I was woken up by Jan and Tur, talking about three dolphins which Carl and Jensen had harpooned in the night. I thought it was some story Jan was making up for Tur and I said, half in my sleep still, what are you talking about? Jan and Tur both started answering at once, and they said that Carl had harpooned two dolphins, and Jensen won. I hurried up on deck in my nightie, and saw three dolphins lying in the bows. First, I thought that it must be thanks to our new harpoon, for we had got a new harpoon, and a new shark hook in Donkergat. But when I asked Jensen, he said that in the night there had been a big school of dolphins near our bows, and that the school had been so big and close together that you only had to throw out the harpoon, and there was a dolphin sitting on it. 
Jensen said that we could easily have caught a dozen of them, but we couldn't have kept all that meat on board, even if we had salted it down. Besides, it's a shame to catch animals when you have no use for them. In the morning, we watched Jensen preparing the dolphins. Now I noticed that he was skinning the dolphins in exactly the same way as they flinched whales in Donkergot. Jensen threw the heads back into the water because we had so much meat that we could afford to throw away the heads, on which there is very little meat. When Jensen was about to clean out the dolphins, we saw that one of them had its mouth full of herrings, and in its throat there was a tiny octopus. We had a favorable wind that day, and Father said that we were not going to take in sail before we got to St. Helena. Such lovely squalls came blowing during the first few days, and you can imagine how we flew along so that the monsoonin thundered and Father sang. On such festive occasions, Jensen used to tell us stories about his grandmother, who seems to have been a sharp old lady. How he laughed when he told us these stories. Sometimes Father read to us the last travel letters he had written in Donkergot for the newspapers at home and at other times, after a hard day's work when the weather was rough or in the evenings when the moon shone. The crew and father got a drop of whiskey in hot water, and then they would light their pipes and tell us about the olden days, and about that time when the monsoonin was called the Vega, and lay sunk at the bottom of Limfjord. From time to time, we saw a whale spouting. The Norwegians call that the whale's blow. Tur went about boasting, saying that when we were back in Denmark, he would show Grandmother that he could dive right down to the bottom of the sea and pick up silver coins like the boys did at Madeira, and he would also try to get Grandmother to climb up to the top of our main truck. On May 21st, the sea was almost still. Jan and Tur made whales and harpooners out of plasticine, and I cleaned up a rusty saw which father had given me for my toolbox. Mother said she thought that Donkergot was the best place we'd been to, with the exception of Tristan, where the islanders had told us they would build us a house if we settled down there. The same day, we saw some blue, shining bits of stuff in the water. They looked like pieces of glass, but they shone and glittered much more. We also saw a school of right whales. Next day, we really got into the southeasterly trade winds, and therefore had a following wind all the way to St. Helena, and still farther. Now we had sunshine and fine weather, but one day the gooseneck on the main boom broke, and we had no end of a job before we managed to mend it so that it would last. We were also unlucky with our new topsail. Jensen, Father Carl, and Christensen had sewn a new topsail out of the new canvas Franck had given us. The old main topsail tore so often that it almost wasn't worthwhile patching up any more. However, we had set the old topsail again, for we wanted to try the new one on the top of the mizzen. Jensen fixed some wooden battens on it to make it stand out better, but when we tried to set it, one of the battens caught in the rigging and broke. 
it wasn't any use putting this sail there. Then we set it as a balloon jib, because our old balloon jib had torn. And when we set an old jib in its place, that had also burst. What awful rubbish we had to sail with. Now I needed only a plane and a chisel for my toolbox, and then it would be almost as good as a real proper toolbox. I had two saws, one of which looked like a fret saw, but it was much larger, and the other was an ordinary hand saw for one person. I had also a proper fret saw and some hooks, which I had made just out of old nails. Saturday, May 24th, we saw a large school of dolphins far away and two big schools of right whales. Both this day and the next, we had to sail by the wind, for strangely enough, the wind had started to blow from the northwest, but on Monday, we got the trade winds again. Father said that the change in the wind was because we hadn't yet got far enough into the trade wind region, and at this time of the year, it happened sometimes that the wind changed just about where we were. <clears throat> when I looked at the log on Monday morning, I saw that we had sailed 587 miles since leaving Donkergat. It is 1,700 miles from Cape Town to St. Helena. Unfortunately, Tur was a bit sick. He threw up and had a pain in his tummy and got masses of castor oil. We all hoped that he would soon be well again. Towards the afternoon, we got rain and a bit of a breeze, but we were only pleased about the wind because now we had a trade wind again. Next day, Tur was much better, but he was not yet allowed to get up because it was blowing so and raining. Soon after breakfast, the strop of the peak halyard block on the mizzen broke. That was bad, but luckily nothing much happened, except that the gaff came crashing down. That day we flew along on wings, and Father said that he was sure we should be in the tropics the next morning. We were making eight knots, and ten when there was a squall. On the previous day, I had been out on the cross trees, but Father said that I mustn't climb up there any more for the present, because one never knew when any of the gear might break for everything was being strained very hard. All the same, I had not expected that the strop of a halyard block would break, a big piece of wood which was nailed on outside to support the mizzen shrouds had also got broken, but Carl was already busy making a new one, and in the afternoon we set the mizzen again. At coffee time, Alfred discovered that the topsail had a tear in it, but we let it stand a bit longer. I knew our course by heart, northwest by north, three quarters north, and I knew the compass by heart all the way round, even when I counted the quarter points. One day Father said that we were halfway to St. Helena. On the morning of May 28th, Christensen told us that the monsoonin had done twelve knots in a squall during the dog watch, and that's very good for such a small ship. From Ascension to Barbados is three thousand miles, and we did them in twenty-one days and nights. During that time we sailed about a thousand miles in five days and nights. One day and night on our fourth journey across the Atlantic, we beat all our previous records and sailed 215 miles. That's how the monsoonin can sail. The monsoonin did the voyage from Saldana to St. Helena 
in the same time, that is, in twelve days and nights, as the four-masted bark Kobenhaven, when she was on her first voyage, her maiden voyage, and we also did the voyage from St. Helena to Ascension in the same time as the Copenhagen in four days, and that is a very short time. On the Copenhagen, they were proud to have made such a quick voyage, so we too may be allowed to be a little bit proud of our little monsoonin. But then we never waste any time either. Now I will tell you how Jan and I used to spend our time when we didn't have lessons and what we had made during all this time and also what Jan and I learnt of navigation. First, what I like best of all is carpentry and I made a big shelf over Jan's bunk, a shelf for shoes, a little stable with a horse and a toy carriage for Tur, shields for Jan, Tur and myself, a box for mother to keep things in and many other things besides. I had also done some repairs. Jan and I often climbed up a loft and played catch. Jan and Tur also played very often at hunting whales, dolphins, and so on. We thought out all sorts of games, and in the afternoon, after we had been in the bath, we used to play cowboys with a bit of lashing father had given me. The bath was made of canvas, which father had sewn together for mother before we got to Rio. It was given to her as a present for her birthday on December 29th. Mother Jan, Tur, and I had been terribly pleased with it during the whole of the voyage. Besides these games, we ran around on deck and played at horses and other things. Father tried to mend our saloon clock, which had gone wrong outside Buenos Aires, but he couldn't put it right. And as we didn't have money to pay a watchmaker, we had to leave it as it was. Father had only an old alarm clock to go by, which had cost five shillings, but he managed well with that as a chronometer. Secondly, we had got rat lines on the mizzen shrouds. Carl and Jensen had put them on. We had also got a new block on the davits instead of the one which went when we were off the lizard. Father had also sewn a new sack for meat, and there was a big new ventilator in father's and mother's cabin. The old one was in bits. Thirdly, we know the names of all the ropes, and of course of all the sails too, and all the other things up aloft. Then, as I have said before, I know the compass off by heart. We can go up aloft, I right up to the top of the mizzen and the main mast. We know how to behave when the watch below is sleeping, and altogether how we ought to behave on board. I can tie many different knots, and almost see by the water how many knots we are sailing. I can tie a reef knot, an eye splice, a short splice, a diamond knot, and various others. Jan and I also steered often, but Jan steered most, because he is the most trustworthy one at steering, father says. Both Jan Tur and I can make racking seizings. We also know a lot of other things, but I can't write them all down, and those I've mentioned are the most important ones. For a couple of days, all went well. On Thursday, we celebrated Ascension Day, and we also celebrated all the other feast days, but I don't want to write about them. On Saturday, May 31st, 
we discovered a big hole in the main sail. Next day, we took down the main sail and started to patch it very industriously. We sewed a big patch on the one side, and the other came to look a bit tattered. But it would have to remain like that until we reached port, for now we wanted to hurry up. Again, all went well for a couple of days. At times we saw right whales, dolphins, or porpoises, but otherwise everything went on just as usual. We started to wear fewer and fewer clothes, for it was getting hot. We had started bathing long ago, and after a bath we used to shoot up half-naked into the rigging. In the hot weather, we, that is Jan and I, went about dressed in nothing but a pair of thin knickers with no elastic round legs and a hat. A hat is necessary in the heat. We were now in the tropics again. The tropics start at 23 degrees of latitude. There are 60 miles between each degree of latitude. Every morning at half past 11, Mother Jan, Tur, and I dived into the bath. In the region of the trade winds, the sun shone almost every day, and we had a good spanking breeze. When we had been in the water for a quarter to half an hour, we got out and let the sun dry us, and afterwards we played horses round the deck. Before dressing in the mornings, we had shower baths on deck, and that freshened us up splendidly. In the afternoon, we also went into the swimming bath. A few days before we got to St. Helena, we saw in the distance the smoke of a steamer, and then we knew that we were not far off our right course. On Sunday morning, June 1st, Alfred as usual discovered land. Father, although he had no chronometer and not even a proper watch, had calculated our course very well, for St. Helena lay directly ahead of us. When we had almost reached the island, we saw a huge school of porpoises. Some jumped ten meters high into the air, turned somersaults, and came down again, sometimes on their back and sometimes on their tail. Some had their young with them. Jensen tried to harpoon some, but they were too quick for him. A big fort stood just by the harbor, facing the sea, and up on the top of the mountains, behind the harbor, there were some cannons. When we had reached the bay, several boats came out to meet us, and the people in them said that they would show us the way in if we paid them. But Father told them that we had no money, and asked them if they would like us to tow them in. We could manage to tow them back home all right, for we came sailing into the bay at a terrific speed. The only boats lying in the bay were those which belonged to the islanders, and there were hardly any motor boats. The bay is only a narrow one, and the farthest point in the bay lies almost a straight line with the land on either side of the bay. Jamestown, which is the capital of St. Helena, lies at the end of the bay between two mountains. It is not very big, but there are many churches. We cast anchor at about six o'clock in the evening, and as we were not going to lie there long, we used a whale line for anchoring which had been given to us in Saldana Bay. It would be easier to haul in when we left than an anchor chain, and as we had attached Franck's buoy to it, nothing much could happen to us, even though some terrible waves were coming along at times. Just as we had anchored, some gentlemen came out, amongst them a doctor. They wanted to see what kind of pirates we were. When they discovered who we were, we didn't have to pay any harbor dues, 
or anything, and everything was all right. They left pretty soon. Their boat pushed off, and everything became quiet. Next day, we were again very lucky, and as one of the gentlemen from the previous evening had invited us out on a long drive round St. Helena, we had nothing to complain about. We were due to go ashore already at two o'clock that afternoon. In the morning, four women came on board. They had brought with them various nice things from St. Helena, but as we had no money, we could not buy anything. However, the women said, cheerfully, that they would like to exchange some of their things for salted meat and tin food, and as we had quite a lot of that, we agreed. In exchange, they gave us several pretty purses, necklaces, and bracelets, which were all made of the pips of some kind of fruit sewn together. They also had pin cushions covered all round the sides with these pips, but Mother didn't like the color of the pin cushion itself. Father and the crew each got a cigarette case with pretty beads sewn on outside. The women also had china things, pen knives, with carved handles and other things like that. Mother very much wanted to have some of their pretty lace, which they had made themselves, but the women refused to take anything but money for that, and also it was too expensive. We also got some postcards in exchange. About one o'clock, we started getting ready, and then Jensen rowed us ashore, by the landing steps, there were some ropes to hang on to when one stepped out of a boat, for there were plenty of waves. At two o'clock, sharp, a young man in a car came and fetched us. First of all, we drove over to the man who had really invited us and thanked him for treating us to such a lovely drive. We drove up to Napoleon's former grave. It was both long and nice, the drive, I mean, of course. Most of the way we drove up among the mountains, and when we had driven a good long way, we got out of the car and walked the rest of the way to the grave. It lay in a pretty little grass-covered piece of ground, and round it grew cypresses and other strange and beautiful trees. It was a very quiet and solemn place, and just by the side of the grave a brook was whispering, out of which Napoleon had drunk every day when he was a prisoner. We also drank out of the brook. A few steps from the brook grew a small tree, which the Prince of Wales had planted. The grave itself was covered by a big square block of cement, and round it was an old iron railing. Jan thought it was very annoying that Napoleon's coffin had been taken away to Paris, because now Napoleon wasn't lying in the grave at all, but Tur was just as pleased without it. From the grave we drove on again, a long way, till we came to the house Napoleon had lived in when he was a prisoner. We saw only two of the rooms, because the French consul lived in the rest of the house. In the first room, there was a book in which we wrote our names, and in it we saw many Danish names. In the second room, we saw an English and a French flag hanging on the wall, and beneath them there hung a little trowel Napoleon had used for gardening and a wine glass out of which he had drunk. There was a beautiful flower garden outside the house and lawns with many fruit trees. On our way home, we drove past a place where a lot of flag staffs had been put up. That was because a big festival was being held the next day. The Danish flag was also there, and Mother was so pleased. We saw many strange flowers, 
such as beautiful big arum lilies, which grew wild. There were some trees with beautiful big deep red flowers, and father picked some of these. Cows were grazing on the grass-covered slopes. Their stomachs reached down almost to the ground, and we wondered why they didn't fall down. Soon we were back at the house of the man who had treated us to this drive. We got out of the car and thanked him. After that, we walked around a bit, because we had some business to attend to. On our way, we went in to a very nice chemist, who was also the mayor, and father invited him to pay us a visit the next day and see the monsoonin. He said he would come with his daughter. After that, we went to the house of a doctor, L. L. Burton, and his wife, who had invited us. They had really invited us for the next day, but we wouldn't have time then, and so we had decided to go and say goodbye to them now before we sailed. They were not at home, however, but as they were expected back by half past six, and it was now five o'clock, we didn't give up hope yet, but went into somebody's backyard and ordered a couple of fowls. And when we left, a little girl came running after me with a necklace. From there we went into a beautiful park and met an old man who asked us if we would like to see their museum. And he told us that we must decide ourselves how much we would pay him. We didn't say no to that, and now we came into the funniest and strangest museum we had ever seen. There were a couple of dried sharks there, a turtle which had been gnawed by something, and whose shell was a meter in diameter, stones, stuffed animals, and an old dead pheasant, which was hung up by the neck on a string. I am sure it had hanged itself in sorrow over the, over the disorder in here. There were also a lot of other things. As it was almost quite dark in the museum, the man showed us round with a little candle, and when we left, father said that he hoped the man hadn't taken us for millionaires, even if he was wearing a decent pair of trousers for once, because those he had borrowed. From there we went to the staircase with the 700, or rather 699 steps, but the people like to say that there are 700 steps, and we walked up 160. But then we had to turn back again. It was getting dark, and we hadn't time to go up any farther, however much we might like to. We walked back to the doctor's house. He hadn't yet come back, and for about five minutes we didn't know what to do, and didn't know whether we ought to go back on board or wait. However, we decided to wait. The maids gave us tea, and about a half an hour's wait, the doctor and his wife came back. Now we got a hot supper, and sat and talked with them for a long time, and didn't leave them till about eleven o'clock. It was arranged that the doctor and his wife would come out and visit us the next day. Then we went down to the harbor hailed the monsoonin, rode on board, tumbled into our beds, and went to sleep. Next day, the crew was going ashore. When Jensen was about to go, he asked if his good friend Jan might be allowed to come with him, and Mother said yes. When they got back again, they told us all they had done. They had been right up to the 699th step. Father also went ashore this day on business, and no one was left on board except Mother, Tur, Luff, and the hens, which we had got on board by then, and I, Mother, and I were kept extremely busy, especially with the cooking. Several times boats came alongside with fish, and we had fish or fish rissoles every day. About ten o'clock, 
father came on board with the mayor chemist and his daughter, and when they left at half past seven, Miss Burton and another lady came on board. Miss Burton and the other lady stayed till after lunch, and when they left, Miss Burton gave us a big parcel with all sorts of lovely things in it, as well as some fruit. The crew didn't come back on board till about six o'clock, and we were due to sail the same evening. But as the crew was tired, and also our only kettle had got broken that same day, and the cook complained about not having enough pots, father decided that we wouldn't sail till the next day, so that father could go ashore and get a kettle and a pot for the cook. And so we did. Next morning, when father returned from ashore, he brought with him a big parcel from Miss Burton. Then we set sail and headed for Ascension in a fresh trade wind.